Phil, here we are in Knock, and thanks for agreeing to do this. And you, as a missionary, you served in Nigeria and Ghana for many years. So would you like to say, tell us a bit about that. What was it like for you? Well, number one, I never volunteered to go on the missions. Mm. Uh, after uh, I got my degree, I was sent to Aylesbury for a year. I spent the year looking after the Irish, didn't have no interest at all in the British. Uh, served a bit in the prison. Had no concept of a, a universal church where there was only Irish for me. So I came back from there then to Carrick and Cross and I was teaching, church. in Aylesbury I was teaching every subject under the sun. It was a very small school and uh, very few pupils, but a very nice atmosphere, all taking place inside the convent building. And I liked it, I enjoyed it. But uh, my trust was always towards why were the Irish here like and um, how was it poverty drove them, were the coping and whatever. And then I came back to Carrigan Cross for a year and then the buzz was physics was becoming very uh, high on the curriculum and anyone that had done science was brought to Monaghan in 19, 19, 1958, all the science teachers to brush up on their physics. And while I was in Monaghan at that course, on the feast of Blessed Oliver Plunkett, God forgive him, Colin Bannis called me and said, um, did I volunteer for the missions? And I said, no. I wrestled with that when everybody was volunteering and on retreat and, you know, in hot air kind of an atmosphere. And I said, no, I don't think so. I didn't do well in England. I only do <laughs> give my attention to the Irish, so... I don't think missions are for me. Then because I had science and there was a big demand for ed secondary education of girls in, Af in, in Nigeria or wherever in Ghana, so Mother Conan said to me, would I m mind to go, they were in need of science teachers and would I go for a tour? So of course I had to say yes and I went. Now do I travelled then in 1958 to Ghana via Cano with Mother Isabel was for my own parish at home. I was at school with my mother and um, arrived in Ghana and um, basically next morning I was in school. Joanna was the headmistress and it, it was no labs. The, the trust was, you know, set up science labs, get schools approved for science objects and that kind of stuff. So I started there, I found, I found the, the girls very cheeky, <laughs> kind of very obstreperous and I couldn't control them and I had no trouble ever with discipline in my life, but when I went to Ghana I couldn't cope. So finally, finally I said to them, well I'd have to punish you people, now I was teaching maths and they'd say, but we never saw X or Y or what's this all about and it's not tangible and we don't want it. So. I, so anyway, I said to them, next Saturday morning, I'm punishing you for this, this stuff. So they said, call, one girl got up and said, call it voluntary work and we'll do anything for you. I think that was the day I really settled for really enjoying those students <coughs> and, you know, getting the hang of them. And then I began to appreciate her rapport with the students, her understanding of the culture and all these things. and that efficiency wasn't everything and that the girls were so happy and all that. So I owe her a lot and I attribute everything to her because I would have been for having things done and efficient, finished in time and all that. So I was in Ghana then from 1958 to 1966 replacing Sister Edine who had been ill at home, who had been there before me. And I was asked to go to Nigeria in 1966 after the Kwame Nkrumah coup. I had good experience in Ghana actually because I joined the science association in the country and I learned how to plan labs and that kind of thing. And that was very welcome in Nigeria. So I was in Oval then for six years, started the labs. 
and the library. I was really always very interested in the library as well and drama and things like that. And um, got on fine, you know. It, it, they were all very keen to do science, but the mathematics was a, a hurdle. They didn't like maths. And then I, at the end of five years then, I was asked to go to Aquinas College, to a boys' college, to look after the girls who were, there was a, a sixth form, boys and girls together in Aquinas College, Akure at the time. So I was asked to go to look after the girls and to teach sixth <coughs> form chemistry plus GCE, chemistry plus Bible knowledge plus I don't know what. And, um, I was there for two years plus, and I I found that a great experience. I got great results. The boys were very, were very interested in science, and they were kind of they were trickish and they were funny and they were good at it, and um, I got on well with them. I, at one stage, I was teaching Bible knowledge to four arms together in the one room. They were nearly, they were nearly at the roof, climbing up the walls. There was no space for them, so I enjoyed that. Then my father became ill, and he was dying, and I was asked to come home. Hadn't done my diploma until then. Actually, when I was in Ghana. Um, when Mother Colin Manus came on visitation, she said to me, well, is it still two years? Do you want to stay for two years or would you like to go home or whatever? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, no, 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 I can't leave here now. The first class are doing science and um, I can't let them down. Mm. And a big smile came across her face. She remembered my objection to going, or my not wanting to go on the missions, and I'd forgotten it. I was completely hooked. So then, from the, so I came home then, and then I got an opportunity in the place of Sister Maud Murphy to do my diploma for a year and commute up and down home at the weekends and things like that. I. I found that very easy because I had a huge experience and a lot of the people that were with me were youngsters and they had no experience and I taught a lot of them bits and pieces of philosophy of education and things like that that they couldn't get their heads around and uh, did that and passed and went back on the missions on, in Og in 1974, that was 1973-74, and come Christmas my father, my father in the meantime rallied, and come Christmas he became ill again, and we were having visitation, and I asked to come home at Christmas, I felt he was going, I felt it this time that he probably wouldn't survive. So I asked to go home and hesitantly I got permission, but I was home. I was actually the only one that was at home when he actually died. And, um, you know, then went back to Nigeria after that, 1974, and then I was transferred to Akure. Anthony was the head, the principal of the school, and then Francis was acting principal, and then because I was senior to Francis, they made me the principal, and I, I, hated, I really, really never enjoyed administration. I loved teaching science because we had good fun in the labs. You got to know them, you had a kind of a relationship with them that you wouldn't have had teaching maths or that kind of thing. And so I was put in charge, but 40 minutes was the longest I could stay in an office without getting out. I didn't like it, didn't enjoy it. I did it and it was we were very much under the government control. You had to get every check signed, countersigned by a member of the Board of Governors and then checked again by the Ministry of Education. So you seemed to, one seemed to be commuting all the time up and down to the Ministry of Education to get this approved and that approved. And my heart used to go out to people that had long distances to travel, you know, to get those things done. So I was that, I was principal then for 15 years. There was a lot of expansion. 
During that time, the government took over no more denominational schools. The military government uh, took over the, all the mission schools and the bishops kept quiet. The dormitories were used for exit classrooms. The enrolment went up from, you would say, 300 to nearly 1,000 overnight. And the, you couldn't take Catholics, for, you know, you couldn't take... It was all on merit, but there was no merit in the end of the day because all the government officials got in, their relatives and the people from the town and the people from the political parties and all that, especially in Akure because it was the headquarters. So it was difficult, it was frustrating. In hindsight, I think, was a foolish decision to go to the bishop and say, we have no Catholic chapel in the school now and there's no Catholic education and there's no this and those now. That and we have land at the back of the convent and um, if we built a chapel outside the school, first of all to fence off the, the, the school land from the mission land, the convent land. So if we built a chapel, it would help the local people as well and the girls would have an opportunity to, Catholic girls would have an opportunity for their faith and whatever and whatever. So he said, oh, no, 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 for a while, and then suddenly he agreed. And I said, like, I went all over there. And also the priest said to me, no, it's not a sister's job to be building it. That's for, that's for the priest, so what are you doing? And we, we, we built a church there on the other side, which is still there, and which the girls were very proud of because it was the second St. Louis church in that part of the... Western Nigeria. So we built a little little classroom block on, on the church premises where the Catholics could go for their instruction. And then the long, Mr. Mildred took those and was very good with them. Excellent with them. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And then the non Catholics came to me, the Christians said, Who will mind us? So I started a program for them. First of all, I thought it was civics, and then I decided to be moral education. So I took them after school one day a week, and very interested. A lot of them were very interested in what the Catholics were doing as well, you know. So that was that. And then finally, there was a lot of talk of retirement. 55 was the age for retirement, and then it was upgraded to 56 or 57 or whatever. And finally, I, f I was waiting for a past pupil, Agnes <coughs> at a deep bed, to have sufficient seniority to take over the school. And it happened. It happened. I waited until that moment, and that happened, and when that happened, I left. But in the meantime, one day, a guy came up from the Canadian High Commission looking for the uh, leprosy settlement and uh, looking for Sister Margaret Fox, God rest her. And uh, uh, somebody in town said, oh no, there's St. Louis, go to St. Louis, go to St. Louis and you'll find out. So he came to me and um, Margaret was in, was in town, wherever she was, and I brought him over for coffee and um, chatting and then he asked me all about free education and how could expatriates be still employed and why was I employed and I told him it was really because we had science and maths, we were the last to be let go. And then he said, and what will you do when you retire? I never thought of retirement and I said, oh, I suppose I'll help the, the people who are disappointed with free education. I'd experienced it in Ghana, I'd also experienced it in now when there's experience in Nigeria, I said I'd probably do something for those. And he said, oh, well, the buzzword in the Canadian High Commission now is women's development. So I said, I could help you. And I couldn't say, well, don't. <laughs> I, I have no authority to do it or anything. Yeah. I don't know when that was, but on Ash Wednesday following, up comes a grant of 60-something thousand Naira for women's development. So I had to tell Isabel, you know, I've got a grant now for something and I have a project going that I didn't intend and that happened, it came, came upon me 
and really she was excellent. She was, she was very accommodating. I mean, somebody else would probably have stalled me or stopped me or something. And on top of that, I had no experience in practical subjects or skills training or literacy training or whatever was whatever. So then I went to Toker and every place and any place to get grants to start in that. So we started the skills training pro program, Matterdy uh, Skills Training Centre in 1971. And it was the most rewarding part of my life up to now. It was, it was very interesting. Some of the girls who came were from the army barracks and they had a rough time from their families and from their husbands and from life and others of them, all of them were disappointed with uh, the education, they thought they'd be graduates next year, that kind of thing, and that there was great hope and free education, it wouldn't cost their parents anything and, uh, you know, whatever. So they, they were very, and their self-esteem was very low. So I started, we started that off with catering and sewing and dyeing and, and secretarial subjects because there were kind of jobs going in the post office and the ministries for typists and things like that. And in the course of that time, on a Friday morning, we had faith sharing. I didn't know what to call it, but we had faith sharing, but it was more life sharing and hearing their stories and trying to convince them that they had, they were good people, they had talents, they had to discover their gifts, they were loved by God, they were special, they were unique and all that kind of thing. Now, that Friday morning session was never missed and one of the teachers always translated into Europe and for a long time they didn't speak but when they began to talk I I found that I, I really, really found that the most rewarding part of my life. And then as time went on, we started computers and really can't remember. It was hard going getting, getting the materials and the machines and the equipment. And then I wouldn't be any good at selling and making money and all that kind of stuff. It was hard. That, the financial side of it was very difficult. And then you had to get approved by the ministry. Otherwise, when you had graduation, they wouldn't be recognised by the specific unions for caterers, for seamstresses, for dying people, for anything like that. So you had to pay a levy every year to the government to get approval ongoing and things like that. But I enjoyed it and I... It was a part of education I found very, very, very worthwhile. And I continued with that then until it was, I was getting old. They were all telling me, ah, oh, mama, go and rest, you're so old. Go and rest, go and rest. <laughs> Brother Tom was hanging around. Brother Tom was a girl SMA. So we started um, work at the leper settlement. And every day he'd come and say, oh, for his coffee, and say, sister, we go to the leper settlement. And then I'd go with them and then I wouldn't be able to do my own work where I should have been working. And it was quite frustrating. I'd be too tired when I'd come back because he was getting old and didn't want to drive in the town. So that was sort of on the side. Neither one nor other done properly in, that's in a sense. But he built 65 rooms for the lepers. He built a church. He built little places for industries. He built endless bathrooms and toilets and all kinds of things there and um, that took up a lot of my time so I felt I didn't get full, it was very difficult to get full attention to both but anyway I managed and I finally retired in 2008 and came home to Ireland. End of story. Phil, thank you. Well done. well done. Phil, thanks for all that so far. But I know that you, you're responsible for a few 
books that were published in Nigeria. Can you tell us a bit about that? I'm not responsible for a few books, but at some stage in the regional administration, they start, we started an education committee. And the venue for the meetings was Matter Day in Akure. And the sisters that were involved, and there were a number, I think they were all invited to come. And we had meetings maybe every two or three months in the year. And early on, Sister Christiana Arakoya said that when Sister Anita Morley was their head, their um, mistress of novices, she made them all get a notebook and she wrote down points about courtesy and uh, maintenance of house and, you know, having a nice environment and all those things. And that she felt that the current novices and postulants didn't have that now and that they were missing out. Mm -hmm. So then we decided we'd do something about courtesy and many people reflected on when they were in St. Louis schools there was Christian courtesy for Catholic girls read it in the, in the dining room every day or every week or every, whenever. So, um, so I remembered a, a phrase of Colin Bannis, the art of gracious living. She was talking about the art of gracious living. So we compiled together a booklet on courtesy, uh, the, this is it, The Art of Gracious Living, which took a good while to, to get done, you know, and it was about, yeah, really. it's about good manners and social customs, consideration for others, be authentic, authentic yeah. respect yourselves, your personal, personal good manners. And then good manners in the community, how to um, behave at table, how to behave as a guest, how to um, behave in conversations and things like that. Mm. So in that group we, we produced this book which is called The Art of Gracious Living. Mm. It, it's all like a bomb all over Nigeria. And then we felt that we talked about Catholic education, what was special that Catholic Church had something to say about Catholic education. <laughs> so we started a book on Catholic, on, um, well, we called it the grace and task of the Catholic educator. I saw that we copied that from somewhere. And then we did a bit about the Catholic Church's input into education and initially. And then we had a bit of difficulty with getting these young sisters to agree to the past pupils contributing what they experienced when they were in the early, early days of the missions when they were in schools and they said, well, they were all treated the same and there was, if your father was a big chief or a doctor or a lawyer, he didn't get special, you didn't get special treatment and they were taught how to speak and how to read and how to be publicly and um, you know music and drama and all these things and they felt they got a lot of values that they were praying their children and their grandchildren would also get but didn't how to get them. Well done. And now Phil, here in Nock. Then when I when I went to Nigeria first when I went to first I felt that I mean, I was really a mad, a mad Catholic, and I felt that there were no books or there wasn't enough books available for girls to learn about their faith. So you used to stay up at night in Ovo with candlelight at night with John Harden's. It wasn't the apologetics we had in school, John. I can't remember what it was. It was doctrine, simplifying that and trying to give them values for life or Christian values or some some input into faith and the commandments and the Beatitudes and that kind of stuff. I did that for a good while. So when I came home then to Nock and saw all the sisters here that had been in England and everywhere and were very well trained in parish work and catechetics and all that, I knew I wasn't in that league. And I decided I'd, um, I wouldn't have anything to offer there without the training, without vetting, without, you know, I had no experience. 
So I started on my own <laughs> explaining the Sunday readings, not knowing that it was such a monstrous job. I mean, it's totally foolish. And people said to me, um, there are books, you can't get books for that. What are you doing that for? And people, I was trying to say, well, not everybody can get books. And some people like this, and they're all into, they're all into the internet. They wouldn't have any books, but they'd be able to find things, and they'd be able to Google things or email things or stuff like that. So I started doing the Sunday readings, trying to put a context on them and explain them and maybe give a little prayer. Great, great, great help from Kieran O'Mahony, Dr. Kieran O'Mahony of the Augustinians. I went to a Bible course there and I got his biblical resources every week. And um, actually, I love doing them. I think I should have done literature rather than science or history or stories or I don't know what. <coughs> and, uh, but it's never ending and it was much too much to take on. I'm, I'm still on it, but I'm kind of winding down now. But right. I sent it out. A lot of sisters, they didn't have much response from the sisters. But a lot of response from priests in Africa. A lot. I think because the priests wanted to prepare their homilies and they hadn't books or time or whatever or whatever. A priest that would have had nothing to do with me at all, at all, at all, at all. We say, oh, please, please send those things. And some, like Sister Mary Akawali and some of the sisters, in, in particularly in that diocese, in all your diocese, got them to her. And then in East Africa, the Father Smith, he's dead now, God rest him, the Kiltigan Father, sent copies of them to various um, formation houses and things like that to make it easy for people to get a little bit of input into the Sunday readings without having to trawl through books. Do you know what? Well, Matthew you feel. And th thank you so much. That was an inspiration from start to finish. God bless. Aww. Bless you.